Hello everyone, and uh, welcome to Medieval Strategies for Cybersecurity. First of all, I have a question. Who of you, raise your hand, is here for the security part? Oh yeah, that's good. And who is just here because it's at Medieval? Nice! You are the people I want to reach. Great. Amazing. Um, let's get into this. My name is Hendrik. I like to call myself a developer for fun and a JavaScript enthusiast. Um, I'm also a consultant at Netlight. And this job finds me in different positions again and again. But I'm always drawn back to programming, to implementing, to creating something myself. But every once in a while, like all of us, I need to take a step back. I need to relax and rest. And this year, I did that on an interrail trip through Europe, together with my girlfriend. And we visited many castles, and atop the ramparts of Carcassonne, I had the idea for this talk, and my girlfriend had the wits about her to take the picture, right? So we're going to talk about what you see in that picture a little bit. What I saw up on the ramparts of Carcassonne, this old castle and Europe's biggest walled settlement in the south of France, close to the Spanish border, was a sign that clearly said disaster response plan, right? Uh, and it said that to me because prior to our vacation, I had been on a security team for six months, right? Uh, I actually wasn't the security expert. Uh, I was more the communicator architecture, but I learned a lot from my colleagues. And, through. and so after this encounter at Carcassonne, I went through the rest of our vacation, visiting even more castles throughout Europe, with open eyes for what we could learn for modern-day cybersecurity from old medieval strategies. And I think these metaphors are super powerful for us as security people and as developers to communicate with each other and to explain our business stakeholders and mothers what we're actually doing. So I want to share some of my inspirations with you. The first thing um, that I saw, and the sign that made me actually inspired for this talk, talked about hoardings. Very interesting word I didn't know before. Hoardings are these wooden galleries you can see here. They are a pre-built response for sieges. They are these wooden galleries that you can attach to the side of a castle wall. They often have holes in their bottom, so you can shoot arrows or drop some rocks onto unexpecting attackers that try to climb up your wall. And the amazing thing about them is they are really pre-made. So there's a skilled team of carpenters and other workers that prepare these things in blocks. And then when a siege happens, there's a hole in the wall through which a beam is thrust. And then this gallery is set on top and it's ready in a very short amount of time. And even more so, these things are a bit adoptable. Some of them had maybe some animal hides on them that were wet and protected against flaming arrows. And um, some of them had different features depending on what your situation was. And that to me so much speaks disaster response plan because the medieval castles, they were actually ready for attack. And I don't know about you, but in my past years as a consultant, I've worked for many companies and barely anybody has a plan in place. Most people have somebody on call yeah, and they come in and they try to salvage what they can. And most of the time, that's shutting everything down 
and then hoping we can redeploy the Terraform stack just fresh. Um, but but is that really the bar? Like, is that where we want to put the bar? I think we should put it quite higher on top of a wall, for example, like a hoarding, right? We should build a hoarding for our company, something that we can deploy in the times of siege or attack. We should have a plan ready-made. How are we going to act? Who are we going to call in? Who can help when an incident happens? And for that, we need to invest up front. We need to invest in times of peace. Where medieval castles had carpenters, we need skilled engineers to come up with how do our things work, what can we do. While hoardings for medieval castles were a temporary thing deployed for imminent threats, walls were a more permanent solution. But most of them didn't actually start out as what we today think of as castles built of thick stone walls. Initially, a lot of fortifications were just wooden palisades. And they were really put up to defend against maybe a sword or an arrow, right? Their job was more keep the intruder out, let us reform, let us prepare for a fallout, for an attack, for a clash, just give us that bit of time. But eventually, as siege weapons came around, wood just didn't cut it anymore. And stone castles had to be erected to defend citizens. And these are the castles that we associate um, today with fortifications from the ages. And contrary to Hollywood movies and popular belief, a hole in the wall wasn't the usual way that a siege ended. It's actually quite hard to break a stone wall with just a catapult or a trebuchet or something like that, right? You need concentrated, focused attacks on a single piece of wall. And then when you have that hole there and you want to send all your troops through it as an attacker, the defenders can quickly create a perimeter around it, just build up some wood there, and they can still climb up on the wall and shoot arrows down at you. It's really not a place you want to be. Most sieges in the Middle Ages were actually decided by something much simpler, by the supply line, by who had the best cook, who had the happiest soldiers, who was most well fed. And latest by the time that cannons came around, walls had to be adopted again, right? A cannon was now able to obliterate a wall in multiple places very quickly, faster than the defenders could adopt to that. And this time we couldn't just build thicker walls, higher walls, we had to come up with entirely new layouts for our castles to keep protected. You can see a lot of these now when you visit the Netherlands. They are the sort of star-shaped castles that you see there. And this really inspires me, because what castles did and what walls of castles did was a constant improvement. Also something that I think we tend to forget. We're not done when we've built the castle. That's when we have started. We need to keep improving. We need to look at, okay, we had a siege. We had an incident. What happened? Sit down, uh, maybe write down what happened. Think about that. Think about how we can improve it. Do we need bigger walls? Do we need thicker walls? Do we need a new layout? Or is it something else that we need? And it was back then, as it is now, most attacks did not go through or over the wall. Most threats that a castle faced were much simpler, if you so want. Most people, evildoers, just came through the front door. Right? They, they went right past the porter. Porters were these soldiers that stood at the front of the gate, checked everyone, scrutinized them, why are you here? What are you doing? I don't know you. I know all the locals. You don't live here, right? Um, and so let's imagine ourselves for a moment as a thief in medieval times. We want to get past this portal. We need some credible authentication, maybe as a merchant from a faraway place that you've never heard about it, um, delivering some spices or something for the Lord. Or we could just jump on a hay wagon of a farmer delivering their products, right? But we need to sneak past this first 
checkpoint. And after we've done that, we would have still have our job cut out for us because after the porters came the door wards. Door wards, also a, a word I think we use way too seldom, are people who stand guard at doors. Quite simple, right? Because not everybody is allowed to go everywhere, of course, right? The kitchen maid has no business in the armory. And somebody from the outside definitely isn't allowed to go up to the Lord's chambers in a medieval castle. Almost nobody is allowed to go up there. So, door wards would scrutinize you again at every door. And they put zero trust into the porters. They totally ignored the vetting that happened at the front gate. It was all about them, their place, who could go there, who not. That's all they cared about. And it also came to the rest of the castle, right? It was much easier in those times to communicate who was coming in and why, and everybody could keep a lookout for that hay wagon and, and which thief might have snuck on there. Um, but in the end, this zero trust that the door was put into the other door wards and into the gatekeeper, the porters, is what really kept the castle safe. And it's also a good practice for us. Let's not trust our API guideways, gateways in front of our microservice landscape to do a check and then everything is going to be fine. Every service is really nice and not compromised. Um, there is a real threat in that that we can compensate by not trusting. So, once our medieval miscreant or thief would have snuck past the porters and door wards, the next obstacle when they want to steal some treasure is a lock, right? A lock is this really powerful thing that defends something valuable. And as a thief, we might have stolen a key from an unsuspecting guard. But tough luck for us. Multi-key authentication for chests was a thing back then. In fact, the chest you see here on the left holds the Handfeste of Bruges, very important documents for the city that at some point had no less than 10 locks. Every member of the crafts, all eight members of the crafts, had a key, the mayor had a key, and the captain of the guards had a key. And only all 10 of them together could open this chest update the documents there. There was no tax card for the woodworkers without something for the masons in it, right? And this created trust. It created a trust in the documents that were stored in these chests. The trust that that was authentic. That's really what we agreed on. Nobody snuck in here. No single person could go in here. Only all of us together responsible for this entire thing, governing our city, could change it together. And I, I think we all know where this is going, right? This is going to multi-factor authentication. Today, our chests are not built from wood and metal. Today, our chests are databases where our users' most private personal data is stored, their payment method, their shipping address, and other personal data points. But we still shouldn't allow a single factor to change all of that, or maybe even just see it. It's super good if we can have multiple factors so that when one of them gets lost, it doesn't jeopardize the entire undertaking, right? When one of the 10 people in Bruges lose, lost their key, the documents were still safe, there's nine more. And we can do the same today for our users. And then there's one last inspiration I took from castles, and it's really hard to visualize, so I, I didn't even try. Um, one of the later castles we visited is beautiful Orquat in Scotland, right next to Loch Ness. From the castle, you can look over the lake. It's much bigger in person than you imagine now, right? And the castle is actually a ruin today. It was destroyed by its last inhabitants after a siege, because they sat down, they were like, okay, this castle is not cutting it anymore. Let's blow it up. Uh, we don't want anybody else to have it. Um, perfectly fine decision, sad for us. Um, I would have liked the tower to be in a better state, to have a nicer view, but anyway. What I'm getting at is, this castle, now a museum, did a really, really good job of documenting 
who was living in the castle. And they documented all their jobs. How the marshal had a lot of people under him making sure security was there. How the steward had even more people under him, always guys in the time, to make sure that the kitchens were run, that food was delivered, that the stables were kept. And it occurred to me at that time that all of these people were important to make the castle run, to keep its inhabitants secure and safe. Because often security is not just about the attacks, right? It's also the, the clerk that makes sure our contract is right. It's the financier making sure we have money to pay the taxes to the king so his army doesn't raid us. It's the cook preparing food so everybody stays happy and alert. All of them contribute greatly to security. And it was really there, looking out over the vast lake that is Loch Ness, that I realized in security, we are all in this together. And that's the last message I want to leave you with today. Thank you so much.